All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Central States or the NNP Symposium, depending how you're tuning in. Um, for anyone who is not aware, um, all of the talks that are held in this room at Central States are also part of the NNP Symposium, meaning we are live streaming them out via Zoom to other people who have registered. So for those of you online, it's just like every past symposium, we just also have a room full of people. So we'll be alternating between the two groups for the Q&A, otherwise nothing should really change. So for this presentation, we are joined by Mark Borkart, who will be talking about the first pe the people of the first US Mint. So I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Liana, and good morning to everybody in the room. And for those of you uh, watching through the portal, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Or dare I say good night in case I put some of you to sleep, but I hope I don't. I'm not a genealogist. I am just a coin guy with a love of history. But I've spent many years researching my own family history. So a natural extension of that interest combined with my numismatic interest is the research of mint employees, especially those who worked at the first Philadelphia Mint from 1792 to 1832. Think of it as family history for coin collectors. For this presentation, I'm going to focus on the first mint era. Officers of the mint are well documented. The day-to-day -day workmen and workwoman are under-researched. The main difficulty in this research is the creation of a list of those employees. Who were they? What did they do? Another challenge is spelling. My own family research illustrates this. My family research, my family surname in Germany was originally spelled B O R. G-W-A-R-T-H. Then in the 19th century, it changed to B-O-R-G-W-A-R-D-T. Later in that century, and in the early 20th century, it was spelled B-O-R-C-K-H-A-R-D-T. And finally, we dropped the H for the current spelling. For each surname variation, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of misspellings. In fact, when it comes right down to it, my surname today is a misspelling. At the first mint, names were sometimes spelled differently within the person's tenure. For example, I believe, but I cannot prove that John Beringbaum and John Birnbaum were the same person. So what are the sources that I've used for my research? There are primary and secondary sources. And even though his work was not published until 1924, Frank Stewart's illustrated history of the first mint, its people and its operation, transcribes several documents from the early days of the Mint. This first document that he published is pretty much self-explanatory. It gives the names of all of the different Mint officers throughout the first Mint history, along with their dates of commission. He published rules and regulations of the first Mint in 1793. And this is a list of names of those employees who actually signed that particular document. He recorded 28 workmen in this document and suggests that it was signed about January 1st, 1793. But I have reason to believe that it was probably actually late that year when it was actually signed. He published employment and discharge dates of minor employees. And this document is interesting because it clearly shows that not only did the Mint have work men, but
but they also had work women. So the first entry is Mary Jacobs and Barbara Summers, who both joined the Mint staff in 1798. Another document was a monthly payroll for January 1796. And this document shows the names of 15 different workmen at that time. There was a payroll for January 1800 that shows for most of them how much the workmen made per year, uh, one per person monthly and three of them on a daily basis. Essentially, the mint workmen and workwomen made roughly a dollar a day. Another document in Stewart's work was a list of officers, clerk, and workmen in 1832. Now, this document shows the officers, it shows three clerks, and it shows 36 workmen, all with their annual salaries. Stewart also, in addition to his document, he mentions other workmen who were in the shop in 1792. What was called the shop was a reference to the actual coinage building. And in 1792, he mentions the names of Thomas Warwick, Thomas Flood, Nicholas Cinderline, Frederick Schell, Louis Laurentia, John Asmos, John Ward, and Patrick Ryan. Several of those employees then continued on to work at the Mint in 1793 and later. There's another historical reference that was published in the 1800s by George Evans called An Illustrated History of the United States Mint. He provides two additional documents to give us information about the early people at the Mint. The bond of indemnity was dated August 1799. Now this document is interesting because it tells us that these particular people that signed the document would in fact return to the Mint after the yellow fever epidemic for that year. What I find interesting is the penalty if they didn't return was 20 pounds. Why was it expressed in pounds and not in dollars? So I did some calculations and 20 pounds in 1799 was approximately equal to $50. So 50 days pay for the average daily workman. I think that would be pretty good incentive to come back. Evans also published, and this is a little hard to see, it's small, but it was a mint payroll from October 1795. And it identifies 11 salaried employees along with nine, 19 workmen who were in the coining department and seven employees that worked at the Mint's Furnace, which was a separate building. Another important document was published in 1795. Elias Boudinot, the Mint director at the time, published orders and, and directions for conducting the Mint at the United States. Now that was dated November 2nd, 1795. And it doesn't actually give us a list of mint workmen at the time, but it tells us exactly their instructions for working at the mint. There were 15 articles to guide employment. And one of those, in order to avoid suspicion, no workman or laborer shall carry about him any of the same denomination of coins at that time striking at the mint under the penalty of forfeiting the same and all the wages that shall then be due to him and be immediately discharged. So pretty stiff penalties. Basically, if they were striking silver dollars, the employees could not carry silver dollars in their pocket. Or if they happen to be striking cents, then the employees at that time could not carry cents in their pocket. So it was sort of an interesting uh, article, but there were 15 different articles, including things like don't get drunk, 
<laughs> which sounds kind of humorous, but the mint actually supplied rum to the workmen. So they're giving them rum and then saying, but hey, don't drink too much of it. A very important document for research into mint history in 1793 was Henry Voigt's daily account book. And it is scanned and accessible at the Newman portal. Voigt's, Voigt's account tells us who was working in the shop, in the coinage department, every day from April 2nd through September 17th, 1793. The last entries were right before the mint closed that year for the yellow fever epidemic. I pulled up a sample page that tells us that three individuals, Jacob Bay, Jonathan York, and Daniel Girard were actually coining on April 13th, 1793. And we know that at that time, the mint was producing wreath scents. So that's what they were making. Another highly valuable resource is contemporary Philadelphia city directories. And virtually every one of them, there's a couple of years exception, but virtually every one from 1793 to 1833, and then in, in later years as well, are available online free of charge at the Temple University website. And they are searchable, and I have searched every one of them for the term mint. And then that has yielded results, for instance, on this section of page, the fourth line down, Adam Eckfeldt, coiner in the mint. And it tells us that he lived on North Fifth near Ray Street. So we can actually find out where Adam Eckfeldt lived in Pennsylvania. I think today that particular location is actually a highway, but that's where he lived at the time. So this particular page was from the 1800 directory. What's interesting about the directory is when you search for mint, you get terms such as minters and mintners and even mintsters, the last for woman. So that's uh, sort of an interesting uh, uh, source of information. Another source is the official register of the United States. This was a publication starting in 1817. It was published every two years. And this is a section from the 1817 official register that shows the officers, it shows the doorkeeper, a carpenter, a melder, and a kneeler. Uh, John Schreiner was a pressman. Thomas Gray was a pressman. So those are individuals that were actually striking the coins that we collect today. So the first edition in 1817, up until the, uh, the I think, late 1870s, the official registers primarily showed officers of the mint. But then if you're interested in later mint history, Let's say you have an 1881 Carson City Morgan dollar, and you'd like to know who struck that coin. Well, the official register will tell you. This is the coiners department in 1881 at the Carson City Mint. So it tells you all the workmen that were there, what they did, where they were from, what their daily or monthly salary was, and the official register for, let's say, 1881, it has multiple pages that show every employee at every one of the mints, the Philadelphia Mint and the branch mints, what they did. It is an extremely important document. And it was published with complete lists until the early 1900s. And then later in the 1900s, they abbreviated the lists. As far as secondary sources of information, there are a number of genealogy websites and newspaper websites that I've accessed. 
FamilySearch.org is the website of the uh, Mormon Church, and it is an incredible website. It has millions of documents, and it's totally free. There's no subscription cost whatsoever, and for family history research or mint history research in this case, it's very valuable. Wikitree.com is a interactive initiative with the goal of creating a single worldwide family tree. Now, a lot of that information you have to verify uh, because a lot of people put information up that is clearly not correct. Um, but it, it's uh, still a valuable source of valuable research. Uh, findagrave.com seems kind of morbid, but it's an extremely valuable site as well. And it's often overlooked. There's usually biographical information that provides you with dates of birth and death in many cases. And again, this is free of charge. Daughters of the American Revolution, another website that has great gene genealogical information. And it's primarily for revolutionary patriots and ancestors. And since I actually have seven direct ancestors that were in the Revolutionary War, I have found this to be a, a great resource as well. Ancestry.com is a subscription site. There is some free information, but for most of the, again, millions of documents, it requires a subscription. Newspapers.com is the newspaper site related to Ancestry.com. I checked their website and they have approximately 800 million pages of newspapers from you know, 27,000 different newspapers that they've scanned in. So again, they're searchable. It's a great, uh, great resource. Another, well, two other newspaper sites, genealogy.bank.com and newspaperarchive.com. Again, all of those require subscriptions, but they uh, have a great deal of information. And finally, cindyslist.com. That's a great place to start for family history research, genealogical research. It is totally free. It is a categorized list of links to online genealogical references. And currently, they have more than 300,000 links to genealogy websites. And it's sorted in 229 different categories. So for specific information, if you're trying to narrow your search, that's a great place to start. So let's talk about the coin makers. The mint director was in modern terms, the chief executive officer. The mint director was the person in charge of everything at the first mint. And there were five men that held that post in the 40 year history. I'm just gonna go over very brief information about each because they all have extensive biographies that are either published or online. So the first mint director was David Rittenhouse. He was appointed by and served under President Washington. And like President Washington, Rittenhouse was born in 1732. He passed away in 1796. And he served as the mint director from his appointment on April 14th, 1792, until his resignation in June 1795. Rittenhouse was largely self-taught. He had very little schooling, but he mastered Newton's Principia at an early age. He had interest in astronomy, mathematics, surveying, instrument making. And one thing I would love to find is a Rittenhouse grandfather clock. They are extremely rare and I have not heard of one coming on the marketplace ever, to my knowledge. I believe they're probably mostly in museums. 
Uh, in addition to being the Mint Director, Rittenhouse served as the Treasurer of Pennsylvania. And he was also an astronomy professor at the University of Pennsylvania. The second Mint Director was Henry William de Saussure. He served for a very short time from July to October 1795. But he is perhaps one of the most important mint directors because he's the one that brought gold coins to the mint. The first gold coins were struck in July 1795, right after he became the mint director. It was actually President Washington who said to him, I have long desired to see gold coined at the mint, but your predecessor found insuperable difficulties. I should be gratified if it could be accomplished. Well, De Saussure accomplished that, and apparently to the gratification of President Washington. The next mint director was Elias Boudinot. He was the mint director from October 1795 until July 1805. Boudinot was born in 1740. He was the son of a silversmith, and he was a neighbor of Benjamin Franklin at an early age. He died in New Jersey in 1821. Boudinot was homeschooled, received his higher education at Princeton, and was admitted to the bar in 1760, beginning a legal practice in New Jersey. Near the end of his term as mint director, Boudinot became a trustee of Princeton and he founded their natural history department in 1805. Following Boudinot, the next mint director was Robert Patterson. He was born in Ireland in 1743. He was appointed mint director in July 1805, and he served in that post until he passed away in July 1824. He came to America from Ireland nearly penniless, but soon found employment, and he excelled in school. He had a love of mathematics, and he actually served as a mathematics professor. Patterson is also interesting as one of five men, all are members of the American Philosophical Society that Thomas Jefferson chose to assist and instruct Meriwether Lewis and William Clark prior to their Pacific Northwest expedition. Patterson had a son, Robert Maskell Patterson, who believed that he would become the next mint director, but he didn't. The next mint director was Samuel Moore, who was actually Patterson's son-in-law. And Samuel Moore was appointed July 1824, and he served until 1835. So Moore was the person that was responsible for bringing in the second mint facility. He was a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, and he served as an instructor there in the 1790s. He later practiced medicine in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And after his mint directorship, Moore developed an interest in coal mining, and he became president of the Hazelton Coal Company. He died in Philadelphia in 1861. The next class of mint officers were the mint treasurers. These were probably the most important people at the mint because they took care of all of the accounts, they kept track of all of the bullion deposits, the coinage, they had a lot of responsibilities. <coughs> the first of those was Trustram Dalton. Now, I have seen his first name spelled Tristram or also Tristam, and I don't know which is correct. 
He was con commissioned in May 1792 and um, previously was a senator from Massachusetts. He was born about 1738 and he died in Boston in 1817. Dalton was a lawyer who graduated from Harvard University in 1755, and he was a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. He was a member of the Continental Congress, the Massachusetts State Senate, and the United States Senate. Unfortunately for Dalton, he trusted his finance to a financial agent who mismanaged his funds, and he died in poverty. Following Dalton, Dr. Nicholas Way, I skipped over, I didn't have a photo of Nicholas Way, so um, he became the next mint treasurer in 1794. As best I can determine, he was probably born about 1750, possibly a little early, earlier than that. And his father, Francis Way of Wilmington, Delaware, was a highly respected member of the Friends Society. Way earned a bachelor degree in medicine from the University of Pennsylvania and his doctoral in medicine in 1771. For many years, Nicholas Way opened his home in Wilmington to those who left Philadelphia to escape yellow fever, and he aggressively treated the disease, but unfortunately, he caught the disease himself. So Nicholas Way passed away of yellow fever in 1797. His replacement, this man, Dr. Benjamin Rush, was commissioned in November 1797, and he served until his death in 1813. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he was considered the most celebrated surgeon and physician of his time. He graduated from Princeton, and he studied medicine in Philadelphia, Edinburgh, London, and Paris. He was Ge Surgeon General of the Revolutionary Army and became Physician General three months after his appointment as Surgeon General in 1777. He was a founder of the Philadelphia or the Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. He was president of the Philadelphia Medical Society vice president of the Philadelphia Bible Society, and he was a founder of Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. The next mint treasurer who took the post after Benjamin Rush passed away was his son, James Rush, who was also a doctor. He was born 1786 and died in 1869, he was also educated at Princeton and in Edinburgh and received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1809. During the period of his mint service, he also taught at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, so he was a busy man. After his death, his estate was left to form the Ridgeway branch of the Library Company of Pennsylvania. After James Rush, the next mint treasurer was William Finley. He was commissioned in 1830 and he remained there into the second mint era in 1841 when he resigned due to illness. Finley was born in Pennsylvania in 1768 and died in 1846. He served in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, he was the fourth governor of the state of Pennsylvania and a senior senator before his mint service. Now, William Finley had a younger brother whose name was Colonel James Finley. And that's probably not important to any of you whatsoever, but it's important to me because James Finley established a fort in Northwest Ohio during the War of 1812. The fort was known as Fort Finley, was on the banks of the Blanchard River in what was 
Findlay, Ohio, my hometown. Mint assayers, another group of mint officers. The first one was Albion Cox. And I don't have a picture of Albion Cox. I don't believe that one exists. He was commissioned in 1794. And he had previously been associated with Matthias Ogden and Thomas Goatsby in the production of New Jersey coppers. He was sued over that enterprise, ended up in debtor's prison, and eventually escaped to England. Well, he returned to America to accept the post of mint assayer, but there was a problem. Congress in the Mint Act of 1792 required the assayer and the chief coiner to each post $10,000 bond for their occupation, for their employment. Well, he was in debtor's prison, so Cox could not meet that requirement. So that is the reason that there were no gold or silver coins struck in 1793. It was strictly copper coins because they couldn't meet the bond requirements, so they couldn't handle precious metals. Eventually, the bond requirement was reduced to levels that they could meet, and then gold and silver production could start. The next assayer after Cox was Joseph Richardson, who was commissioned in 1795 and served until his death in 1831. He was one of the longest tenured employees at the first mint. He was from a Quaker family of Philadelphia goldsmiths. And probably if you can, you can maybe tell from this photo, he was described as a man of under the medium size, light, active, of quick perception and prompt decision. Richardson incidentally was also the maker of many of the early Indian peace medals, including the Washington Oval Peace Medals. So uh, he had a great deal of importance at the first mint. He was followed by his son, John Richardson, who served very briefly from 1831 until 1832. And then after that, Jacob Reese Eckfeldt was the mint assayer who brought the mint into the second mint era. Eckfeldt was the son of Adam Eckfeldt. And he actually served from his appointment until his death in 1872. So he was there for basically 40 years. Now, Jacob Rees Eckfeldt reported that English gold sovereigns were below standard, to which the British Mint said, we don't make mistakes. But Eckfeldt proved that they did, much to their embarrassment. He was uh, heralded as a very important man of science. He was also co-author of two books, A Manual of Gold and Silver Coins of All Nations and New Varieties of Gold and Silver Coins. I believe that those are both on the portal, is that correct? So those are both accessible at the Newman portal. Chief coiners. The first chief coiner was Henry Voigt, who apparently was the first officer commissioned at the Mint. He was hired as a acting chief coiner on June 1st, 1792. And he served until his death in 1814. I haven't found a photo of Voigt, but I found his grave marker which has a mistake on it. 
we know that Voigt passed away in 1814, but this grave marker says he passed away in 1811. So I don't know if it was installed at a later date, which is very possible, and somebody just got the year wrong, or if they just forgot to add the extra elements to the second or the third one. I don't know. But I just find it interesting that it's off by three years. The next chief coiner who replaced Voigt was this man, Adam Eckfeldt. He's probably the most recognized person of those that worked at the first mint in terms of the average collector today. He was born in 1769 and he died in 1852. And prior to his official employment at the mint, he did blacksmithing work for the mint and was paid for the same in December 1792. He's listed in several city directories as a blacksmith. And he was hired at the Mint I guess in 1794. He was on the Mint payroll in 1795 as a dye forger and turner at an annual salary of $500. He was commissioned as the assistant coiner on January 1st, 1796 and his salary increased to $800. And he was then commissioned as the chief coiner in 1814, and then his salary increased to $1,500. So for the average person making a dollar a day, those were fairly substantial salaries. He retired in 1839, and it has been said that he was a frequent visitor to the Mint after that time, and some people have even said, well, he had an office in the Mint even until the day he died. Although that may not be the case. The late Carl Moulton, who did a lot of research and actually wrote a book, a biography on Henry Voigt, went through all of the Mint's visitor logs for that period of time. And there was one instance, I believe in 1850, where Adam Eckfeldt actually signed the visitor's log. So the question is, why did he sign it that one time if he was a frequent visitor at the Mint? So Moulton believes, and I tend to think that Moulton is correct, that Adam Eckfeldt was not a frequent visitor after his retirement, and he was apparently only there one time. The next position of Mint officers were the melters and refiners. That was not an established position in the original Mint Act of April 1792. It actually became an official position uh, later on when Congress added the melder and refiner to the Mint officers list. But the first of those, I haven't found a photo of him, was David Ott, who was hired as the melter refiner pro tem in 1794. And then Congress added the position in March 1795, but apparently Ott was never commissioned for that position. He was paid as early as 1793 for assay work at the Mint. And he resigned his position in November 1796. His replacement was Joseph Cloud, who I also do not have a, a photo of or a picture of, Cloud was commissioned as the melder and refiner on January 2nd, 1797, and he served in that position until his resignation in January 1836. So he was there for a very long time. The official reversion of his resignation was poor eyesight. However, there was a letter that was sent to Joseph Cloud from the Mint director at the time, Robert Maskell Patterson, in October, 1835. <laughs> and I'm gonna read this because it, to me, it's fascinating. Mint director Pas Patterson wrote, I have been exceedingly distressed by the extraordinary occurrence of last evening 
and am very much embarrassed to reconcile my old personal friendship with the course which I feel to be dictated by my official duty. To be put to the necessity of investigating the accusations which have been made would be very painful and, as some of the men would have to be examined, would give to the scandal a degree of publicity which, in every account, it would be very desirable to avoid. Still, I do not see how this can be prevented if you continue attached to the mint. Dr. Moore told me when I first joined the institution that you had said you meant to resign, and I understand that you have frequently expressed this intention. If such should be now your determination, I see no reason why anything more need to be said on the subject of the rumors afloat in the Mint and the circumstances intimated by Governor Finley. But I am authorized to promise that the whole affair shall be kept secret and that your feelings and those of your family spared. I shall be desirous of hearing from you as early as may be convenient your determination in this matter. Okay, so what did Cloud do? We don't know. I have looked and I have not found any further information. Apparently, Mint Director Patterson kept his word that the whole affair has remained secret. I would love to know. <laughs> The Mint Engravers, Joseph Wright. He was born in New Jersey in 1756. And it's said that he was the engraver of the Liberty Cap Sense of 1793. His mother was a very famous wax modeler named Patience Lovell Wright. And Joseph Wright, the first engraver at the Mint, well, he may have been the first engraver at the Mint, we're not quite sure. He became a victim of yellow fever in September 1793. So the image here, it's an unfinished portrait, self-portrait of Joseph Wright, his wife, Sarah, and their three children. And I assume it's a pretty accurate likeness. Wright <clears throat> did a, a profile of President Washington that it was the source for many later engravings of the president. It said that he designed several silver and copper trial pieces in 1792 but he was never an official mint engraver. But he was a yellow fever victim in 1793. Supposedly, he designed and engraved the dies for the 1793 Liberty Cap Sense and then passed away before the first ones were struck so that he never actually saw the coins after they were produced from his dies. The next mint engraver, I don't have a, an image of him, but Robert Scott was commissioned on November 20th, 1793, and he served until his death in November 1823. He was a watchmaker who was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and he later learned the art of engraving and he came to America in 1775. A few years later, Jefferson, asked him to engrave medals for presentation to Indian chiefs. And Scott accepted private commissions for other work throughout his term at the Mint. So he was doing a lot of moonlighting. The next Mint engraver, William Neese, was commissioned in January 1824, and he served into the second Mint era until his death in 1840. He was a book plate engraver before his work at the Mint. 
he was born in 1780, and as I mentioned, died in 1840. He was favorably known as an artist in his community. And it is said that in relations of life, he was conspicuous for his sterling integrity and amiable disposition. Assistant engravers, and I don't have images of these, but there were two insist assistant engravers at the first mint. John Smith Gardner, we don't know much about him. We know that uh, he was not a commissioned bin officer. And his name did appear in the October 1795 mint payroll, payroll at a salary of $936. He assisted with design work and dye preparation. There are many students who have said that Gardner actually created dyes himself. Walter Breen, for instance, said that certain 1794 large scents were the Gardner heads. Or, but we know that's not the case. And I see one member of our in-person audience shaking his head no. And um, I get it because uh, um, it was actually uh, William Nyberg uh, did a book called Engraving Liberty, an excellent book, which was a biography of Robert Scott. And Nyberg talks about Gardner and says he probably helped to finish the dies, to polish them, get them ready for coinage, but he never engraved dies himself. Apparently from Nyberg's research, he also approached mint director Boudinot, wanting to fulfill the position of the mint's melter and refiner, but he really didn't have experience in that area so he tried to convince Boudinot and the Mint to send them to England for a year to learn the trade so that he could fulfill that position. Boudinot said no. The next assistant grader in engraver was John Wright. He was commissioned April 1st, 1807, and he resigned March 31st, 1817, so he was at the Mint for 10 years to the day. And um, those of us who do coin cataloging uh, like to refer to John Reich's 10 year tenure. Okay, Mint Workman. I'm just gonna mention a few that were at the Mint in 1793. And most of these, I do not know much about whatsoever, even though I've tried to find information. The names come from Henry Voigt's Daily Ledger. Jacob Bay, his first entry in Henry Voigt's book was April 2nd, 1793, which was the first day that, uh, of the book that we have available to us. There was apparently a previous daily ledger that Henry Voigt kept that has since been lost. If that could be found, that would be very important. So Henry Voigt's last entry was, I'm sorry, Jacob Bay's last entry in Henry Voigt's book was August 12th, 1793. He does not appear after that. So we don't know what happened to him. We he don't know fired. if he, he either he got, got fired for being drunk twice. Well. I'm, we know he was drunk at least once because Henry Voigt on June 5th entered in his book that Jacob Bay was drunk and was to be fined. So I have reason to believe that Jacob Bay, who spent most of his time cutting punches for dye engraving, was the same Jacob Bay that was a Germantown, Pennsylvania type founder in earlier years in the 1770s and 1780s. There's also another record at ancestry.com that mentions the name of Jacob Bay, who was a Germantown constable, but I do not know if that was the same person or not. Thomas Flood worked in the shop. Again, the shop was the coinage building. Records show that he was there as early as September 27, 1792, 
And he was a laborer who appeared in Henry Voigt's books from April 3rd through September 17th, 1793. There's a record of an individual that immigrated from England to America in 1767, whose name was Thomas Flood. I assume it was the same person. I don't know that it was the same person. Daniel Girard, his name is sometimes spelled G-E-R-A-R-D, and other times it was spelled G-I-R-A-R-D. He was another laborer who worked at the Mint in 1793. I believe he's the same individual the records show immigrated to Philadelphia about 1787. He performed a variety of tasks at the Mint, according to Voigt's daybook, including annealing, boiling, cleaning, rolling, casting, cutting, and coining copper. On July 24th, there's an entry that he was actually coining half sets. So we know that here's an individual that actually made the 1793 half sets. His entries in Voigt's account book range from April 2nd, the first day, until September 12th, 1793. Frederick Geyer, whose name sometimes appears as Ernest Frederick Geyer, was another person who signed the rules and regulations. And his first date of uh, employment, according to Voigt's account book, was in August 1793. Louis Lorange, whose name also appeared as Laurentin or Laurentian, was an employee that again signed the rules and regulations document, and he appeared in Voigt's daily ledger. For example, on June 3rd, Voigt reports that Lorange was cutting copper, so cutting out planchets. Patrick Ryan, was another one who began work in November, 1792. His name appeared as either Ryan R-Y-O-N or Ryan R-Y-A-N, depending on the different sources. And his name was in Voigt's daily ledger throughout 1793. Jonathan Schreier, in October 1795, the payroll says that he was the chief pressman, and he earned nearly $2 a day, so nearly double what the other Mint employees earned. The January 1796 payroll shows Schreiner as a pressman of gold coins. So that's sort of interesting for determining who might have produced the gold coins from the 1790s. He appeared in later years. The official re register shows his uh, employment at the Mint as a pressman in 1817. So we know that he was there for quite a long period of time. Nicholas Cinderling, whose name was also Cinderling, was a workman that actually started in July, 1792. The Mint property had another building on it prior to the Mint being constructed. And that was uh, uh, a distillery that was known as Michael Schubert's Distillery. And that had to be torn down before the Mint building could be constructed. So Cinderling was one of the uh, workmen who actually took part in the destruction of the Schubert distillery. He then continued at the Mint. His name appears throughout Henry Voigt's ledger. He was still employed there in January 1796, where he worked as an annealer. He continued as an annealer in January 1800. I did find the name of a Philadelphia resident in the 1790 census, whose name was Nicholas Centerling. I assume that, again, is probably the same person, but I can't prove it. 
Matthias Summer was also a workman who started with the destruction of the Schubert Distillery. He signed the rules and regulations document. He was a laborer earning about $4 per week in 1793. There are records of a Matthias Summers who was born in Pennsylvania in 1735 and died in 1801. Again, it's hard to say that he was the same person. He may have been, but it's really difficult to know for sure as there were multiple people throughout genealogical history with similar names, even if they're unusual names. Two other employees were Jonathan Ward and William Ward. They were both at the Mint in 1793. I do not know if they were related in any way whatsoever. They may have been. There's just no way to know for sure. Thomas Warwick was apparently a foreman at the Mint in 1793, as he was earning $1.50 per day much higher than the dollar a day for most other employees. There are various records for Thomas Warwick in the Philadelphia city directories. In 1794, he was identified as a blacksmith. And I have records of a person of that name in Philadelphia that was born in 1770 and died in 1823. He may or may not have been the same person. Jonathan York was a laborer in 1793. He was working at Coining on April 6, 1793. And there are Philadelphia City Directory records of Jonathan York, who was a laborer. Jonathan Zollinger, another laborer at the Mint, was earning about $4 a week. His name appears in some records as Zollinger with a Z, other records as Solinger with an S, or Sullinger. So again, what his real name was, I don't know. There are records that suggest that he was born about 1765, although that individual born in 1765 named Jonathan Zollinger was found in 1790 and 1800 census in the Pittsburgh area. So he's probably not the same person. And that's all I have. Uh, actually, I, I should mention real fast, since I've talked about researching men employees, I actually have a list of about 200 names of workmen at the first US Mint. Uh, I, would like to know that that's a complete list. I doubt that it is, but my list is about 200 names. All right. All righty, then we will do the Q and A. Um, so we already have a couple questions that have come in over Zoom. So I'm gonna do one of these first and then we'll open it up to the room for the next one. Um, for those watching over Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says Q and A. You can send in questions there and let's get started. Let me pull this up. All right, um, was Robert Hofer involved with the Carson City Mint? Was Robert Hofer involved with the Carson City Mint? I know that there was an individual at the Carson City Mint by the surname of Hofer. I don't recall his first name, uh, the best person to consult on that is a Carson City Mint historian, Rusty Go, who published a three-volume history of the Carson City Mint that is highly recommended for anybody interested in the history of that facility. All righty. Um, then does anyone in the room have any questions? Nope. Okay, we'll return to Zoom. Um, what documentation exists regarding the underweight sovereigns and the exchange with the Royal Mint on the subject? If I recall correctly, and I, I don't have those notes right in front of me, 
but there was discussion in Jacob Reese Eckfeldt's obituary about the whole incident. That obituary is available online at the newspaper websites. Uh, do you have it on the portal, Len? That obituary, I believe, was written by uh, one of the Patterson descendants. Um, and I think we do have it. Just do search by author Patterson. Okay, so uh, search by author Patterson is the uh, possible source for that obituary. If I recall, that's where that information came from. All right. Let's see. Um, any insights on any of the work women listed in the payroll documents? As far as insights, I'm not sure exactly uh, uh, what you're looking for. There were several work women at the first mint. Uh, one of them, Barbara Summers, I believe may have been the wife of Matthias Summers. Uh, there, there was actually the Summers family. Um, most, most people think of the Eckfeldt family as being the, the first mint family uh, where members of the Eckfeldt family were employed at the first mint and later at the second mint and even at the third mint starting in 1901. I think Stewart mentioned that there was an Eckfeldt working at the uh, third mint in the, in the 1920s. So that family is thought to be the, the mint family. However, the Summers family also had a number of family members that worked at the first and second mint in the 1800s. Uh, there was, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Martin Summers was a doorkeeper at the Mint. And then when he passed away, his son Philip took his place as the doorkeeper in 1804, if memory serves. So the Summers family uh, uh, had a couple of the female members of the first Mint, and they were a, a family nearly as important as the Eckfelts in Mint history. I believe the women were employed as adjusters. Typically, typically the mint, the work women were adjusters. And they, uh, I, I recall one particular document that had two of the, the women working as adjusters earning 50 cents a day, while the men in that same position were earning a dollar a day. All right, um, yes, we have one in the room. What was the job of the doorkeeper? Was that security? He's a watchman. The, door, the doorkeeper was a watchman. <laughs> okay, um, for any other questions in the room, I am going to repeat them just so the people on Zoom can hear them coming through. So one second before we answer them. Um, let's see, and we skipped the room between the last two. So were there any others in the room? Yeah. I didn't hear you talk much about the formation of the National Point Collection and the curators who started with that. Yeah, it said, I didn't hear you talk much about the National Coin Collection and the curators who started that. You are correct. <laughs> uh, the National Coin Collection supposedly was started by Adam Eckfeldt, the chief coiner, who set aside samples of coins as they were made to form a coin collection that became the National Coin Collection. It was displayed at the Philadelphia Mint throughout the 19th century, eventually transferred to the Smithsonian. And I say supposedly Adam Eckfeldt started it because I don't believe I've ever seen any documentation to that effect. It, it's always been rumored. Len? Yeah, there, there's one statement in uh, Pledges of History in 1846 that says, Eckfeldt was setting aside uh, okay. pieces even before the uh, congressional appropriation started in 1838. And that's our only source. Okay, so there is at least a source. Okay. All right, we're going to go back to questions online. Um, how often did Jefferson enter the mint according to the records? <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. Oh, right. Yeah, I doubt that there are any records. Supposedly, Jefferson provided all of the 
silver for the 1792 half deems or half dismes, whichever you prefer, and then uh, received 1,500 of them. But I don't know how often he visited the mint, if he did at all. Bill. Okay. Well, probably didn't because when he was president, the White House was in DC and the mint was in Philadelphia. So he probably never did. Um, Washington, according to Eckfeld, uh, used to come by the mint every day and see what they were doing. But there is absolutely no record of him being there more than once. So uh, I think all these ideas of presidents visiting the mint are wishful thinking or hopeful dreams or something. Okay, so basically, for those on Zoom, the the response from an audience member whose knowledge of Mint history is uh, quite keen uh, is that basically, no, the presidents did not visit the Mint. There are really no records to that effect. All right. Um, and did we have any other questions from in the room? Yes. Uh, you, you did you did skip one of the die stickers of the very first one, Henry Boyd. Uh, he said, you did skip one of the die sinkers of the first men, Henry Voigt. Okay, well, Voigt, Voigt was obviously the uh, the chief coiner. Um, did he sink dice? Do you, according, according to Boudinot, he did. According to Boudinot, Boudinot made some comment in 1795. I, I, this is not an exact quote, but he basically said, until with the time we were able to find an engraver, the chief coiner, the coiner was required to engrave the dies. I think that's pretty close to what he said. All right. Um, <laughs> over Zoom, uh, we have, who was the mint guard dog? Okay. <laughs> so you are, you are chuckling over that, Liana. I am. <laughs> but... The uh, the one mint guard dog that Stewart talked about in his mint history was, in his words, a savage brute whose name was Nero. <laughs> and Stewart went on to say it is easy to surmise that he was not kept at the mint as a play fella for the watchman. All right. Uh, anyone else within the room? No? Okay. Uh, then I think that is all of the questions that we have for now. Last chance to get in the in over Zoom or in the room, and one came in. Uh, how late did they still do adjustments on Blanchett's? I think meaning for how many years? I don't know specifically when they would have stopped doing adjustments on planchets. Basically, adjustment marks appear as scratches on the coin, but they were actually purposely done at the mint to adjust the weight of planchets that might have been too heavy. They weighed the planchets, they adjusted them before they struck the coins. And this is for silver and gold coins, of course, not for copper. I don't know exactly how many years they did that, certainly into the 1800s. Uh, eventually, the, um, uh, the mint had the, the mint rollers and the, the draw bench to refine the uh, uh, planchet thickness, the strip thickness. So at some point, they really no longer needed to do adjusting of planchets. But I know there are certain Morgan dollars from 1890s, I believe, primarily the San Francisco Mint, that actually show very fine lines across the portrait that were from the rolling and drawing process. And those lines didn't get totally struck out when the dollars were struck. So they aren't technically adjustment marks, but they're the same principle. 
they, they, they first applied steam power to the rolling machine in 1816, I believe. So when the process got mechanized, maybe they had some quality control. But that, 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 could, and, you know, that could be. Yeah, so uh, uh, steam power to the, uh, the rollers was probably applied in 1816. There is documentation that the Mint had a steam engine in 1816, but it was not used for coinage. Um, so it would have been probably used for rolling purposes, which would have uh, lessened the need for adjusting. All righty. Uh, good deal. Then we do have many more in Zoom and we are close to running out of time. We have about five minutes. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to the room one more time. Anyone? Yes. I think it was uh, Scott, as you mentioned, had a lot of outside projects. Yeah. Said, I think it was Scott that you mentioned who had a lot of outside projects. Is that correct? It is correct. Um, if you get a copy of William Nyberg's book, Engraving Liberty, he actually has a complete catalog of Scott's engraving works, uh, something like, I don't know, 1,200 entries. And uh, they go out throughout the period of his mint employment. So does that imply that the private mints uh, in Philadelphia at that time were fairly well established? I'm, I'm assuming Scott didn't do have his work done by the mint. Okay, the, the, the follow-up question, does that mean that private mints were fairly well established? When I say that Scott did other engraving work, it wasn't coin engraving. It was engraving for various printing projects, encyclopedias, atlases, that kind of engraving. All right. Uh, do we know exactly which early copper coins used planchets imported from Bolton's Soho Mint? Uh, we do. Uh, I don't off the top of my head, <laughs> but... Um, uh, Walter Green's Encyclopedia of Early United States Large Sense has a great deal of information about the planchet sources for various individual dye varieties. So there is documentation as to which planchet sources were used for the uh, various early copper varieties. All right, uh, do you know when the mint got its bullion fund so that depositors could get coins right away? I don't know the specific answer to that question. Um, originally, the plan was that depositors would receive their coins in the same order that the deposits came in, but eventually the bullion fund allowed the mint to pay out coins for the deposits of gold and silver, but I don't know the exact dates on that. Okay, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, so we do have quite a few still left in Zoom here. Um, let's see, were Mint employees put through any kind of security checks before being hired? I'm sure they were. I don't have any specific information on what security checks might be involved, but they certainly weren't just going to hire workmen to come in and work at the Mint without some sort of background information. Uh, there are a couple documented cases of thievery at the first Mint, uh, at least in at least one case by a Mint workman who worked in, in partnership with, if you will, with outside people. All right, then we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, for anyone who has any other questions, you're welcome to send them in on the symposium website. Just go to the Contact Us page, send them in, and we'll forward them on to Mark so you can get in touch that way. Um, otherwise, remember that all of the presentations are being recorded and will be uploaded to the NNP in about two weeks. Um, if anyone here in person would like to receive an email when those are up so you can check them out. Um, just go ahead and register for the symposium itself. The URL or a QR code is on the sign up here or the one out in the hallway. It is entirely free and takes maybe two minutes. Um, so if you would like to be notified when those go up, do that. Otherwise, we will be starting here with uh, Bill Eckberg in about 15 minutes. So stick around for that one. Thank you. <laughs>